Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. This is Jeremiah J. Mam and Errol J. Man Speaks coming to you live and direct from our global headquarters here in The Rock. Okay, we're here with Ask the Experts, Anything Meaningful Friday. And today we're here with a special guest right here from The Rock. We got Rock Squared. We got two rockers. We got rock and rollers. We're really talking about real estate, how you can list dozens of homes and how this uh, second generation realtor has been doing it since right around when she could walk. But let me let her tell the story. So let me introduce, hold up, here we go. Kali Bracci, everybody. <laughs> Colleen, it's so yes. nice to have you here, even though you're a couple offices over in the same building. Um, it's kind of we funny. We spend every morning together, pretty much. We do. We're always the first ones in and, and like last ones out. We're the heart. We're hard workers, I would say. Well, we like to play and work, so sometimes the day gets a little longer. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Well, for the folks that don't know you, and guys, uh, put in the chat, put in the comments where you guys are watching from, and then we have an ongoing discussion with how do you pronounce her name? I'm not going to say it because I, I don't want to influence your decision. Phonetically speaking, how would you pronounce it? Uh, here in Rochester, we have funny accents like we call Charlotte, Charlotte. We call Chili, Chili, things like that. So I'm interested to see see that. But why don't you introduce yourself? Tell them a little bit about you and your history and your team and everything that you do. Okay. So um, I was born into real estate because my dad owned his own real estate firm. And he um, dealt specifically with investment properties because he was buying investment properties since he was 19 years old. Um, he started working in Xerox, um, doing engineering and part-time real estate. And then lo and behold, uh, about two years after he started part-time real estate, he got his broker's license and then opened his own company immediately. So um, he had that company for over 30 years and um, he owned hundreds of investment properties in the city. Um, so my Saturdays and any weeknight that he needed me would be um, going to collect rent, cleaning out apartments, throwing uh, tenants out back in the days when you could actually throw them out and not have to go to court with it, um, where you just kicked all their stuff out to the curb. Yeah, I did that with him. Um, taking asbestos off of um, a big ass boiler in a building with my bare hands for a couple of weeks. You know, Wait, things like that, that explains a lot. That explains a lot explain. how that yeah. may have affected you. And I've you only really. had cancer once. So really, you know, how bad was it, right? <laughs> but anyhow, um, so yeah, I didn't have a choice. I was, when I was 10 years old, back in the day when they did not have computers, we had these little like index cards that you had a black and white photo of the house, if you were lucky. And then, you know, like this very small little uh, grid that would give the very, very, um, most basic information, but you had to replace those cards every week with ones. If one expired or one got sold, you had to move them out. You had to alphabetize and then put them in the right order for wards, which our city was broken up in wards back then. But anyhow, so I started doing that when I was 10. When I was 12, I started working on uh, the desk every weekend. Um, and so I didn't have a choice. I, what do you, oh, you, you mean working that, working on the desk in the office? Oh yeah. Sorry. Working on, yes, working on the, you desk know, you use, yeah. we, a lot of, you know, real estate terms and sometimes they're regional. Cause I, I might say something like opportunity time in another market and they go, what the hell is that? And like yeah. office hours, oh, yeah. or desk time or whatever you want to call it. Right. Yeah. Well, he had a lot of, uh, he ran a rental agency as well. So we'd have tenants coming in and pay rent and everything. And, you know, it was just, they didn't mind handing it over to a 12 year old behind the desk apparently. But, you know, so, uh, when I was 18, all you needed to, um, get your real estate license in 1984 was you had to have a high school diploma and go through a 35 hour course. Did the 35 hour course when I was a senior in high school and two weeks out of high school, I had my real estate license. So that's all she wrote. Wow. And so now you've been in the business, how long? 1984. My math 30, skills, 39 years, 38 years. Almost Over 30, 40 three years, years, Colleen. Older than you, Jeremiah. <laughs> um, I'm older, almost. Not by much. Not you by can't... much. <laughs> Not by no. much, though. Maybe you I were two. I was born in 1979. 
So okay. I was I was in kindergarten when you started in real estate. I was like, someday I want to be like that lady there, sure, throwing yeah. people out okay. of properties. And but but by the way, my dad was successful because he was doing the business nobody else wanted to do: the slum right. properties, the city properties, the properties that nobody else could sell because they were pieces of shit. Oops, can I say that? It's on okay. The show? Yeah. No, no. There's there's <laughs> not a lot of censorship on this right. one. So anyhow. Um, and that's how I fell into the niche that I'm in. And it, it's, it's funny because I have similar story. My father was a real estate investor, not, not to the level of yours, but as a kid, I remember cleaning out properties. I remember doing electrical work when I was like 10 and when I'm like, dad, is it, is it, is the breaker off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, oh, it's not off. Not off. <laughs> that happened, that happened to me too. I was going to tell that story. Like, I put my finger in a light geez. socket. Oh, nope. Didn't flip the right switch. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's funny because my dad worked for the department of labor. My dad was a labor standards investigator. Okay. So I wish I would be happy with him. <laughs> not good. Not good. Okay. So you've been in the business now a while. I, just to kind of edify a little bit. How many transactions did you, did you guys do last year? 369. 369 transactions. I'm going to put that in the, in the comments. And that's why like, I wanted to underplay it. Cause I feel like so often, like in all the marketing stuff that I sent out, I said more than 300. Cause sometimes they go, Oh, she probably did 285 and they're rounding up. No mofos. I rounded down. Okay. 369 transactions. And so that's, you must have a team of like 50 people. I must, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I have five very hardworking people. Well, four plus me. And um, yeah, we are busy and we're all very hard workers and we're all dressing in jeans and climbing through windows and breaking down doors on a regular basis. <laughs> so five team, and, and this is why like, I wanted to kind of mentioned both because so often there's people you see them they're doing big numbers but then they have an office their team is really their office that they all put all under one person of you know yeah. oh i got 30 people on my team and you did 300 so that means you each did 10. Mm -hmm. hold on let's give them a round of applause <laughs> you did it. okay uh so i i think it's to be commended doing that many transactions with with four four plus one uh, how do you do it? So I think in the beginning for those who, because everybody, every single live stream I'm on or a part of, or zoom that I'm in, they're like, the sky is falling. Ah, the interest rates. Oh, uh, so l let's talk about like, how do you find investors? Like what's a good way to find them? You don't just, besides the, you know, putting us you know, on a sign and saying investors needed and hanging out in the. Well, there's a, there's a number of ways to do it. It definitely helps being, uh, you know, back in my early career, people came to me because they knew my dad and knew his business and knew that he knew how to get it done. So they assumed I knew how to get it done. I learned as I went. Um, my dad was one of those who just like kind of my first listing appointment, I went into the office. He was supposed to go with me. He goes, nope, sorry, I can't go. You got to go on your own. And so it's kind of a sink or swim thing with my dad. It was learning by experience more than anything. Um, but so initially it was because of my relationship with him. As I got into the business and he got out of the business, um, people knew that I knew what I was doing in the investment property arena. So, um, you know, it hasn't always been an easy arena to be in, but um, back in 2008, I started selling um, real estate in a different way than I'd ever done before. I got contacted by a company out of the UK and they were an investment company that basically pooled their investors money or had a pool of investors. And they told me to find houses that meant a certain parameter. They would never see the house. I would take pictures. Back then, there was no videos, no video cameras. I had to take a picture with a regular camera, upload it to um, you know the internet, and then write a report on it yeah. and send it off to them. There was nothing simple like a FaceTime video to walk through with people. So um, the year I started working with them, I sold them 98 houses. And at the end of the year, I had this giant world map in my um office 
I had sold to people in 47 countries Holy because God. through the UK company, they marketed it out to all over the world. I sold to people in South Africa, Israel, um, how, how many 40, 47? 47. 47. So wow. it was, it was pretty cool. And that started me in this, um, this situation. Well, first of all, they had me go to London to present at an international property show so they could get more buyers. So I, I worked with them for a couple of years, but in doing that, other parts of the country, people from other parts of the country learned who I was and I, it just kind of took off from there. They knew that I knew how to deal with foreign national investors and, um, and I worked hard and, and I don't sleep. So like if you're in Israel, I will talk to you at one o'clock in the morning, our time, you know, because right. I'm up, why not, you know, or send an email and answer. So, um, that's a good and a bad thing. Cause as soon as your eyes open in the middle of the night, you're like, Oh, I could talk to this person right now. <laughs> so we do this, but, like, hey, um, what are you doing in the middle of the day? Oh yeah. Oh. But long story short now. And the other nice thing about working with foreign nationals, by the way, they cannot typically get a loan to buy an investment property, unless it's a half a million dollars or more, or it's a second home kind of thing. Um, yeah. Our low end investment property, always cash deals, always cash, which is pretty cool because you don't have to worry about financing and appraisals. But back to getting the listings, um, you know, I do a lot of marketing, um, you know, every year between Christmas and New Year's, I handwrite addresses on envelopes of out of town owners um, especially ones that I see might have a lot of violations on their property through the city website. Um, I feel like maybe they are um, at their wits end because their property manager isn't doing a good job or their property manager is telling them they need more money to fix the properties up. Um, so, you know, I look for situations where I feel like the property owner might be having a headache, you know, drive by a house out and see that it's boarded up or the grass is really tall now and doesn't look like the house is being lived in. I hit up that owner. I have a vacant, vacant house list that we, all of the team, when they see a house that's vacant or looks to be vacant or run down, we hit them up with a letter. So it's a lot of different ways to, um, to okay. get them. Let's backtrack a little bit, starting with, uh, cause I, I kind of want to, reinforce the fact that it's, it's not easy, right? In the beginning and continuously, you're willing to do the things that others won't do, uh -huh. right? As I see you come oh, into the office and you have your socks over your jeans because you just came from a flea infested house or you couldn't get in, or you got a squatter in a property that you're literally yelling to them for them to get out of the house and, and, and you know, all, you know, dangerous situations and scenarios, but there you found a niche, right? And, and you kind of like your father introduced you to it, but it's also uh, the referral business that you get, I think, from other agents when you're not willing to oh, do right. things. Cause I'm like, Colleen, please every take day, this listing, please. You know, I was like, take my wife, people please. From other companies, not just our company, yeah. you know, um, for those of people that don't know, our company has a, um, has two offices, one in a kind of elite suburb of Rochester, and yeah. then us on the dark side of Rochester. But we have more fun, okay? Yeah, but side. When I first joined this company, and there's over 100 agents in our company, when I first joined them, I put together dog bones and put them in a cellophane wrap and put a nice little bow on it with a tag on it that said, if you get a dog of a listing in the city that you don't want to deal with, send it my way and I'll throw you a bone. I put that, that's I went so over to good. Pittsburgh and I put that in everyone's mailbox. And I, that, that started the ball rolling. When people got called to do a listing in the city that they weren't comfortable with, we got the call. But it happens with other companies too. I got a call from a Keller Williams agent the other day saying, I'm sending you this guy. Because they know difficult properties can be sold by us. Um, difficult properties with difficult tenants can be sold by us. Um, you know, it's, we see it as a challenge and we rise to meet it as much as possible. Yeah, no, I like that. Well, and, and that was just mind blowing for what you said about the, the vacant property list. And, you know, I know there's people watching from all over the U S right now and, and on the playback. So it's like, maybe go to that local municipality, find out if they have a list of vacant properties. Usually they have like a zombie property list if you're in they New do. York because the neighbors report it and they want the damn thing to be foreclosed on and somebody to take it over and, and maintain it. So if they have a list, trying to figure that out, but then also making sure that the 
the billing address is not the same as the property address, right? Where the tax bill is sent uh, mm -hmm. is how you figure out there's an absentee landlord. Right. Uh, and then I also like you said, like if there's violations, right? It's, it's like get them when their pain point, like it's at its highest, like I can't take this. I can't evict them. I got violations. I got the city calling me and then ring, ring, ring. Hi, this is Colleen. Would you like to sell your property? And they're like, yes. Oh my gosh. I can't believe you called me or, or contacted me. Yeah. So that, yeah. that that's, that's amazing. What, um, how can I'm you all, then do you search sorry. up? Sorry. Sure, my, it, one, one more thing. Sorry. Yeah. With the city lists that they have um, in our city, and I'm sure in many cities, they have a point of contact for properties that's right on the website. I've been able to search that based on a bad property manager that I know and actually send letters to all those people knowing that they were all in distress because of the property manager. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you can find out who's oh, connected with the property. Another part of that. What, um, how can you, because this was the next part, so if I find somebody that that has is an absentee landlord, do you then like search the county for the same name with different billing addresses to see if they own multiple properties? So then, oh, it's, yeah. yeah, is that and just simple as that? Doing, search the tax record, or how do you do that? Uh, you can do it in a couple different ways um, through the just through real list, you know, our our MLS tax searching system. You can put punch in the name of the person and also punch in what state they're from if they're not from New York, because that helps narrow it down a little bit. Um, Good point. You can, there's uh, there's city records too, but um, it's easier to go through our MLS. I don't know what everybody else's MLS is like, but I've learned how yeah, to. Yeah, I think everybody has like a tax record type of system yeah. uh, where you could search that, or if you have Remind in your market, you could search that and just, you know, it's billing address, not the same, but once you find one, then do a secondary search to see if they have multiple properties. I know, uh, you know, we sell waterfront too, and, and it's same with waterfront. Sometimes they call you for one and really it's like, I'm testing you out for this one property. Uh, and they won't mention it always. Right. But there's been times one listing on the water could turn to four or five because they had a, a, a portfolio of properties. Right. I had one listing. It was a very rundown house. I sold it within a day. The owner was very impressed. He had me sell another house on the same street that was tenant occupied and much more money. And then the third house I sold for him was a four hundred and fifty thousand dollar house on the water on Sodas Point. Nice. So, you know, I never turned down a listing. I don't care if it's a $10,000 listing. I have sold houses, many houses for $10,000. Um, I never turned down a listing because I always feel like something else is going to come around from it. You know, you always, if you do a good job, you always, they'll remember your name. They'll tell your name to people that need you. Right. And, and the referrals are huge. Yeah. I mean, with good service, there's always opportunities, right? And even when you treat a tenant right, that tenant can become a buyer. And then when they buy their first house and their move up house and their luxury, you know, so it's like if you work with people at the right times, then you have business for life. If you've been doing it for 38 years, you have some repeat business, but then you also get business from like your sphere as well. You I don't do. totally ignore your sphere, right? You were involved with the no. school system and that, and, no. and you, yeah. you get a lot of business that way. So you're kind of working it from all angles. Um, the other thing that you want to be, if you're especially an investment property, you're interested in, in doing investment property is there are a lot of landlord organizations out there. Um, one in particular that I deal with is a REIA organization, R-E-I-A. It's a national organization. It's Real Estate Investors Association. Um, Rochester has the largest chapter in New York. It's called FRIA. They just add two Fs in front of RIA. I attend their meetings. I'm a vendor member. I attend all their meetings or every Thursday. Sometimes there's two meetings in a day, morning and night. Um, they do housing provider support and they do um, alternative investment strategies and they cover everything from tenants to toilets to, you know, mansions to, to sheds. Um, and because I'm a vendor number, a vendor member, I'm on all the literature that gets sent out to it, all of the members. Say it again, no, real estate investor. F, uh, it's real well, estate. For, for the national one. What's the national one? R-E-I-A. And, and uh, people who are real estate investors across the country know that name. Um, but it's very. I got it. Yeah. Here we go. National RIA. It's, it's really a great organization to be part of. And 
I have gotten many, many sales out of that. Just well, being a part of the meeting. And and even like my wife's a part of it and she's not in there to get listings. She's there because we have investment properties as well. And Correct. it really is a wealth of information. The resources you have guys on there that own hundreds of properties that are willing to Private share. Finance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and they'll, yep. they'll help you. They'll do, you know, they'll help you burst stuff and do whatever right. else you want to, you want to do yep. if it makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Uh, here's, here's a good question from, uh, Brian Phillips, the Brian Phillips team in the big apple and beyond he's in Harlem world. Oh, great guy. Um, here's his question. I'm gonna bring it up on the screen. Ba -doop. Do you assign your team members specific roles? That's great question. question. Um, I am, a huge listing agent. Um, so the reason I started with a team is because I could not cover all of the leads I would get every time I had a listing. So the way I started it off was, um, you know, I was getting the listings and I would send them out to get the buyers. Um, but we also, I was working with big companies that, you know, um, had a demand of, you know, 20 houses a month. And so, I started to assign it to the people that I knew were comfortable working with investment and being able to give good sound advice to the buyer. Um, so I kind of, I started them off as buyer's agents, but now a lot of them are also listing because they have a relationship with the buyer that they sold the house to. And many times with investment properties, you'll get somebody who just wants to diversify and every couple of years they want to turn around and sell a house. I've sold some of the houses five, six times over the same house each time. So um, it comes back in the investment property. It's not like you buy a first time home and you stay in the house for 10 years. It's a couple of years from now, you may decide you don't like single families anymore and you want to buy doubles only. So you sell all your singles and you buy doubles. There's a lot of things, but the role that the team plays is basically support for me. And then I send out as many listings and, uh, and leads as I can to them to keep them going. But I, I do like the idea I don't like when people specifically just assign a role to a, to a person not. on a team because what if you need them to do something else? Now they're not prepared yeah. for it, right? You have them cross-trained in everything and yeah. in the way that you do business, right? If they, yeah. if they went to a real estate class online, they're not yeah. going to get the specialized no. knowledge that you know, no. you know, with no. the, un the universal door key known as the crowbar, you know, and yes. all the... Uh, <laughs> I have, I have bolt cutters too, by the way. Yeah, the bolt. That was a birthday gift one year from one of my teammates. The, um, I can remember when I first started and they'd be like, what are the showing instructions? Screw gun. Yes. Yes. <laughs> what? Yes. I have one of those the, too. The plywood on the front the impact, door. I got the cordless impact screwdriver. It's so awesome. Love it. Oh, uh, it's like um, in many of my houses, but I, I do totally agree with you. I don't like when I see a card that says buyer specialist on it because you're limiting yourself so badly. And I don't ever want to limit my team. I want them to grow and expand and, and yeah. prosper because that's how we all do it. What, uh, how do you, how can you, cause I think some agents they're like, I just took one listing. Ah, 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 and then you come in and you're like, Oh man, I just listed 12 today. And it's like, I want to smack you sometimes because you're like, oh, I'm so excited. 12 listings. And I'm like, okay, all right, go leave, go leave right now. I don't want to talk to you for a little while. Um, <laughs> how are you able, like, what's the system? Like when you get multiple of those, do you, are you taking all the photos? Do you have a photographer? And then are you going like, do you map it out? It's just interesting to know like the, the inner workings of, of this. How does that work? So quite often when I get calls from people out of state, our very first step, obviously, to get the addresses that they want me to consider, but then we got to get in touch with a property manager. Um, I have a good relationship with a lot of the property managers in the city, especially if they're good. If they're not good, they probably don't like me a lot because I'm selling a lot of their houses because they're not doing a good job. Um, and there are a couple out there that don't like me, um, but they're forced to work with me if their age, right. if their client says. I want Colleen to list all my houses. They have to be cooperative with me. So I, the very first thing I do is contact the property manager and say, I need tenant information. I need their names, their phone numbers, how they pay the rent, what the rent is. I try and get that basic information. Are they behind in rent? You know, that kind of thing. And I often tell my sellers, because when I'm going into these properties, I'm getting these tenants who are so exasperated with the 
property manager. Yeah, in real cases. They won't fix this. They won't fix that. The landlord's a jerk. Da 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 da. And I often tell my sellers, look at your tenant is probably, if you ever talk to them, is going to tell them that I agreed with them and that you are the biggest jerk in the world. You're the biggest slumlord ever. And it's true. I will agree with them because right, I need build them to be my friends. Yeah to be cooperative in my showings and make them feel like I am on their side. And that doesn't always work, but it works quite a bit of the time. And so we get into the houses, we do a quick walkthrough, take pictures, take notes. And, and my whole team knows how to do this. And then we you know, get the link to the iCloud pictures and we prepare um, just like a, a basic report for the owner because they have not seen these houses nine times out of 10 in a couple of years. Their property <laughs> managers are telling them that they yeah. replaced the furnace, but the furnace I took a picture of is 20 years old. Yeah, it's the Williamson so, you know, from 1964. And I take pictures of good things and bad things so they're aware of the whole picture of their house. Um, and once that's done, I counsel them on what I feel the best price would be and how to get it going. And a lot of times, because I have so many investors, um, I have an exclusive right to sell agreement that allows me to market off market to yeah. my investor database for a period of time, maybe two weeks, sometimes, sometimes more, sometimes less, because the landlords don't want their tenants to get spooked of, by million yeah. people going through. Um, they prefer a nice quick sale. Um, and I can often give that to them. So I, I want you guys to kind of pay attention to that whole conversation that Colleen, starting with when you meet the tenants, I think that's a mistake that a lot of agents make. They come in like, I'm the realtor. We're putting the house in the market. I'm going to give you 24 hours notice. Get with the picture. You're going to get kicked out. And, and I, I've always done it. I might've learned that my first couple of years. I can't remember even who I did. Maybe it was just in, instinct, my instinctual. Um, I was like, okay, I, I want to make them my friend. Right. Because I'm going to see them often. And yeah. so and, and having that conversation like, look, at this could actually be a good thing, because when somebody new takes ownership, your lease is going to carry over and they want you to be happy. So let's figure out all the things. What Every are all day, the things? Right. Every day. Yeah. And, and so now they look at you like, oh, she's my hero. I, I, totally. I need this house to sell. I need to let them in. And, and, and it's going to be a great day. Yeah. I, I love the whole that. spiel that I say to them, you know. I know it's scary to have people coming through your house. I know it's scary to think that you're going to be under new ownership, but obviously things aren't working out very well right now with this seller for whatever reason. And whoever buys the house is going to want to keep you because you're a good tenant and they're going to want to fix it up and make it nice for you. So you stay here and be happy. And when it comes to showings, we will never show up to your door, knocking on the door unannounced. We will never spring an appointment on you five minutes before we're ready to be there. You will get 24 hour notice minimum. And what we do, by the way, is not only do we call and text them, we also hand deliver notes that we put right on their door, at least oh, a day. I, I think I learned that from you. It, you used to say snail and nail, snail, yeah. sna right? Like you would go and like staple yeah. it or, or, or yeah. tape yeah. it or duct tape Absolutely. it. Yep, um, yep, I think time. I did learn that because I was like, okay, that's because it's good. You put it, you mail it to them, you call yep. them, you put it on the door. And then I would even go one step further, take a picture of it and then oh, send yeah. it to everybody. But like, yo, you were notified every which way, land, sea. That's a good You're idea. Like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, because you will get tenants who say, I didn't get a message. I didn't get an email. I didn't get this. And you can be like, um, the tape from the note that I put on your door is still there. The blue painters tape that I use, that's right there. You know, yeah. and, and so, yep. yeah, it is. That's fine. It's a challenge to work with the tenants. The other thing, and I think we kind of briefly discussed this, we both had a mentor named Bob Kirby. Yeah. Who did a lot of city property and dealt with a lot of tenants. And he had a system that he called fish food. I call it the fish food philosophy. When you do get a tenant who's not quite so cooperative and maybe a little cranky, Oftentimes it's helpful to be like, hey, if you cooperate with this showing, I've got this gift card for you. I'm, I, I just so appreciate your time. And I just want to reward you for really helping us out because you're doing us a solid. And I'll give them a gift card to like Starbucks or McDonald's or whatever. And these people, especially some of the ones that are really appreciative of it and I have to keep showing their houses, they know that the gift card's coming with me when I'm coming. So they don't give me any trouble when I call for another appointment. Well, and it's, it's, uh, again, it goes right to like, I'm on your side. 
And, and really it's, it's a f five bucks, right? Five bucks can mean all the different, I had that and, and it wasn't even in an investment property, but it was out in, uh, in Wolcott. Uh, it was the wife, the kids were selling and that, and right. The stepmom didn't get the house kind of a deal. You had one like that with burnt to the ground or whatever. Um, and she wouldn't, she was really being challenging, but then I, I was like, oh man, what's a great place to eat around here? She told me, I didn't tell her I was getting her a gift card. But then when I came back, I had a gift card for her and she almost cried. Like she yeah. was like, why would you do this? I'm like, because we're inconveniencing you. And I, uh, I just want to say, thank you. Totally. Right? Oh, yeah, you have just, to treat them with respect and hopefully they'll treat you, but with respect back. So once you contact all of the, it, this is where it helps to have help, right? And scheduling oh. and lining them all up and making sure you can get in. I can go through like a dozen houses in a day if it's lined up correctly. It takes me about 15 minutes to walk through a single family house, take notes, take pictures. Talk now, to will you that. like pen and paper notes or like audio record it or what would what you do? Uh, I, I used to do audio, um, but now more than ever, I just use my note feature on my phone. Um, and okay, digital. it's nice because yeah, I just you put the just address. Share it with this. It's dated. So if I lose track of the pictures, you know, maybe I didn't download them enough or quick enough, I can go back and say, okay, I looked at that on February 6th. I got to find the photos from February 6th. Then I can refer to it, you know? So, um, a couple different ways like that. And I, and I like that. over the years, I mean, you just, if you take pictures, take pictures of every mechanical, everything that looks good, everything that looks bad. Sometimes you don't even have to take notes other than maybe, um, you know, what the tenant's telling you about the leaking toilet or whatever. So you can report that to the uh, owner and you get it fixed before you start showing the house. Well, I, I like, cause we're all so busy. And as you have multi, all these transactions, I couldn't even look as she gets, she gets a phone call. Um, <laughs> like having a digital note taking app that just think of it as your diary in a way, right? Yeah. So that, you know, oh, like okay, this property at this time, I talked to this tenant, you're not going to remember 369 conversations, but if you have something to reference back, that's not, you know, easily yeah. accessible wherever you are, then, then I, I think that's the better and way to be handle very, it. Um detailed in the email that you sent to the seller as well, because you can always refer back to that. In that email, I write down what the taxes are. I put in what the square footage is. I put in what the tenant says she's paying your rent or what the property manager is saying. I put down the information about the CFO. Um, you know, so it's right at my fingertips. If there's something wrong there, they will tell me um, and it'll all be in the same email chain. So along the same lines, Let's say you get these listings, but as you go through, and every municipality is going to be different as far as uh, you know certificate of occupancies and that that kind of stuff. But you have a lot of experience with this. Do you then say, okay, this, 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 and this is going to be a problem? Uh, new yes. owner is probably going to want a CFO. Let's uh -huh. take care of this now before we have to do an inspection and then a reinspection because that's going to delay the process by months. I think, in uh -huh. the in like as the backed up as they are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with that. I, I give them two options. I tell them if you want to sell the house as I is, see. especially in the yeah. seller's market, they are able to sell it as is right now. If it was in a market where it wasn't quite, you know, more, more leaning towards the seller, then I would tell them you might want to do this, this, and this before you sell it. But right now I'll tell them, look at, if you want to sell it as is, it's a drawback that there's not a transferable CFO or not a new CFO on the property. That's going to cost you five, ten thousand dollars off the value of the property in the eyes of a buyer. So we can sell it as is at this yeah. price, or you can do this and say you'll have a new certificate of occupancy at closing and get this much for it. And they sometimes decide, you know, yeah, I'll just sell it as is because the property manager already ripped me off, or I can't afford to do any more repairs right. or whatever. Um, or they'll say, yeah, I'll get it fixed up and I want more money for it. So it works. But it's good to have that knowledge and expertise up front. Cause I, yeah. I, I was talking to, um, he's one of the net inspectors for the East Ave Park Ave area. His daughter's a realtor at a re recent event. And he was saying like, he always remembers any realtor that's like, we need to get this done. Do you understand? We're supposed to close. And he's like, that's not a me problem. That was a you problem because you didn't plan accordingly. Exactly. I can't expedite it. It goes right in the order of the things that are received. So sorry exactly. for your luck. It's going to close when it closes. Yep. Right. Procrastination on your part is not an emergency on my part. 
Amen, sister. Amen. Um, so the, the property, the CFOs, how do you feel about the market right now? How do you feel about the fact, because this, I'm tired of hearing, oh, the market's transitioning, uh, the bottom's hot. Is that affecting your market at all? Because you said like mostly they're they're buying cash anyways. So like interest rates, who gives? Interest rates do impact our market in a different way, though. Um, you know, most of my transactions are cash. So the owners are like, why do we care about the interest rates? Our transactions are cash. Well, the interest rates are going up, which means the houses might be taking a little longer to sell, which means there's more supply, which means the demand for the property that you have that used to be the big fish in the small pond is now the small fish in the big pond and your house isn't quite so valuable now because there's other choices out there for them so that is definitely an impact um and, and of do, course they, do they sometimes if they buy a cash like cash out add debt service to it so that they can use that money i mean not the the the, the four nationals that you're saying but the local investors, right? If somebody's, yeah. somebody's buying a, yeah. a few properties, they use the oh, old yeah. Burr technique or. Yeah, totally. Right, buy, yeah. rehab, refinance. Yeah, so that does, that impacts it as well. Yes, definitely. Do you think long-term the folks that are buying at the height of this market? Are going to suffer? Not in our area. Rochester's always been a very conservative market. I think in other parts of the country, it might be a problem, but Rochester's always been very conservative. And when everybody else in the country had that great big burst or bubble yeah, um, we didn't have that. several years ago there, we remained the same. We were like one and a half percent appreciation rate. It was ridiculous. And I would tell yeah. my investors, if you're buying a house today for $30,000, if you keep it up, in five years, you can sell it for $30,000, but you will have collected five years of rent. So, our, and our rent yields are very high. We have low cost, high yield rental properties here. And that's what attracts people to Rochester. That's why people from all over the world buy here. Um, but yeah, that definitely, um, I was just talking to a client who cashed out all his properties just this morning when I was talking to you. Um, he's from, from Australia. Australia. He bought a million dollars worth of properties before he even came to Rochester for the first time. Um, and he goes, you know, if I had held off and sold my properties now instead of five years ago, how much would I have made? And I said, you would have doubled your property money. Right. It so we <laughs> are finally money. catching up with the rest of the country. I don't think we're going to see a burst. I think we're just going to maintain, honestly, especially when it comes to the investment properties, because our rents went up when our prices went up. So we're still yeah. high yield, low cost rental. Properties. So even though that debt service, if you're putting some on it at a higher interest rate, you're getting more rent. So it kind of equals itself out if you're looking at the cap rate and that, that kind of I stuff. sold a house yesterday for $63,000 and the tenant pays thirteen fifty dollars a month in rent. Yeah. 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 There you go, guys. Here, I gotta I hit him with this. <laughs> if if you haven't heard a sign that the rock is where the place, you know, the place to be for investment properties. But I think maybe the last thing to cover, we'll talk about horror stories, but it also um like property managers. I what I see agents, the big mistake I see them do is, is get greedy and say, I want to sell investment properties and I also want to be the property manager. That's part one. Part two is how do you decide what property managers you want to refer? Do you like have conversations and go through their processes? Because that affects your credibility and reputation, totally. right? Um, for the longest time, I it was very difficult for me to um, recommend any property manager. I tried several, several of them screwed over my clients. Um, and some learned from their mistakes and others did not. So they're still on my, the bottom of my list. Um, I have been, I have been courted, if you will, by many property managers who will take me out to lunch or dinner and try and tell me all about their services. And then say, if you send me a client, I'll give you a referral fee, or I'll give you a 500 bucks. If you send me a client for management, whatever. I have never taken money from a property manager for getting a referral because I feel if I'm recommending them to a property manager, the best thing they can do for me is manage it right. So yeah, I can take care of the client. More properties to them. That's all I ask for. And it's the same conversation I have with every property manager, whoever offered me a referral fee. Um, it's, it's difficult because a property manager 
is never in a good spot. Nobody, it's, there's never a time where everybody loves them. You either have a tenant who wants something done on the property, right. who's mad that nothing's getting done on the property, or you have an owner who you are collecting money from to make the tenant happy, and now he's not happy because he's paying you. So I always say property management is a thankless job. It's yeah. also a job that you cannot do part-time. So if you're a realtor and you want to be a property manager, you better make your choice of one or the other. Yeah, you're going to be bad at both of them. They're both full-time jobs. <laughs> yeah. 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 So. Okay. Good stuff. So I give them, there's like three, and they're all FREA members, by the way. That's a very important thing to me, that FREA organization, if they're involved in that, they're learning every time they come to one of the meetings. And uh, with the eviction market, the way it's been, like we get updates every week on where we are with it and what's happening and rent relief funds and, you know, the whole nine yards, city violation um, grants. And, you know, we get a lot of information out of that organization. So... If you're interested in the investment property arena, you definitely want to be um, on an organization like that. Yeah. So we, we posted in the comments for you guys, the national RIA to find one near you if you're not in the Rochester area. Uh, again, a big part of this, if you're going to sell investment properties, you need to educate yourself more. Uh, but also for your clients that are investors, they can always learn more instead of watching HGTV and thinking that that's going to help them. Uh, yeah. Why don't we finish off with horror stories? Because I hear so many, but I want you to share. Let's share some of your favorite ones because we don't want to, you know, with 369 transactions, there's also a lot of heartache and, and scary moments. And, you know, it, it does take a special person to be able to do what you do um, and not be afraid of anything, no matter where you are. Uh, a female, Caucasian female. Right. I don't post a thread. I'm a fat white lady walking through the neighborhood. They know I'm not there to kill them or anything. They usually uh, laugh at me. Um, but I oftentimes walk up to houses with sledgehammers in my hand. So that may also deter anybody bothering me. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, horror stories. Um, most recently, there was a two family house that a guy from like Maine or Massachusetts, something um, used his mom's money to buy a two family house. Uh, in Ravine, on Ravine Avenue, Jeremiah's. Um, so anyhow, I get called like four years ago. An attorney told him to call me because the house is vacant. The property manager's taken off. The owner's getting fined because nobody's cutting the grass. It's, it was left vacant and unsecured. So he got fined for that. I get called. I go over to the property, break in. Um, it's being occupied by a squatter who's been there like a year and a half with no power, no water, no nothing. Um, oh. it's just trashed every, there's three bathrooms, every bathroom, sink, toilet, and tub were full of Poop. Um, stuff. Blech. So yeah, the smell was atrocious. Um, but here I am walking through it because that's what I do. I had a handyman come with me, push me through the window because we couldn't get in through the doors. Um, and that's how the handy, how the homeless guy was getting in. He was climbing into a shopping cart and climbing into the window. Anyhow, we knew the shopping cart was pulled up to the house. He was still inside. When the shopping cart was moved away, he wasn't home. So long story short, I get an offer on the house for $15,000. And I tell this guy, you are really lucky. Take this money and run. This is like five years ago. Um, he says, no, I think I'm going to hold out until I can get a little more. I'm like, are you rehabbing the house? Cause you're not getting more. The longer it sits, the worse it's going to be. Right. Well, guess what? He proved me wrong because last year I called him and I said, Hey, you still interested in selling the market's a little bit better. We can try it again. I listed it for 15,000. I sold it for 28. Yeah. <laughs> Almost doubled the money just, and, and really doing was, nothing. It probably deteriorated, but the market appreciated. It, oh, and the homeless right. guy was still living there. The homeless guy was this still there. This guy, is at, he's had a place for, he's not homeless. He's not homeless. No, no. And he had a home. lot of dog containers too. So he's definitely eating well, you know. But anyhow, when I showed that house, I unlocked oh. it. I told everybody to wear boots, do not wear open-toed shoes, to come take a look at it. Of course, some realtors showed up in open-toed shoes. Yeah. I said, bring a flashlight, bring a hard hat, bring whatever you got because it's not in great shape. I unlocked the door. I stood on the sidewalk while I had a mass showing. We had like 40 people through the house in over an hour. And I locked up the door. I went to my next couple of appointments. And three hours later, I had to go home and change my clothes because I still smelled like the house. 
that I did not even go inside. I just unlocked the door and stood on the sidewalk. You're going to your next appointment. They're like, yeah. Is that you? I mean, so yeah, definitely. (laughs) So, I mean, uh, things like that, you know, and, um, it's honestly, it's not boring. I never know what I'm going to get into. Sometimes a, a tenant will open the door and immediately become violent or volatile and mad that somebody's here. Um, other times I, I walk into a house that's in the middle of a horrible area and it's the best kept house I've seen in months. So you just never know what you're going to come up with, but, um, it's never boring. There's never a boring day in my life. <laughs> Every day is a new adventure in real estate, baby. I would um, be bored if I had to do nine to five and right? be even more bored if I had to do just those plain old, no adventure residential owner occupied oh listings. wait a minute totally hold bad. up wait a minute oh, we no. got this story we were about to tell it we almost let let it go so the boring residential property in the suburbs uh that let's we don't have to mention any addresses or anything but let's talk about the scenario of the disgruntled stepmom that didn't get the house and then woo, 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 what happened are you t- wait which one are you talking about the one that got that caught on fire oh. Oh, Hold on, wait, yeah. I got to give you like ominous music. Here we go. All right. I hired somebody that his past broker had said he was uncoachable. Said he knew the kid's coach in high school for football who told him he was uncoachable. <laughs> and this gentleman who had him on his team, I love him to death. He's one of my favorite people. Um, but he, he sells country club real estate is what I called it. So I thought, yeah. well, maybe the kid's not comfortable in half million dollar homes. All right. So, you know, every dog gets a bone or a blind squirrel gets a nut once in a while. Right. This kid definitely was not extremely motivated. Um, he hated cobwebs because when I made him go down into a basement to take pictures, he was Ew. completely freaked out by it. I'm like, boy, there's a lot of cobwebs in our job. Anyhow. Um, he gets a listing. It's his best friend's father's house. The father died and the stepmom was living in it. Not a uh, girlfriend. I think it was long-term girlfriend. Uh, she claimed that she had right to the house, but her name wasn't on anything. And according to the family, she never did anything. Well, so she was very unhappy when we put it on the market. She wanted to live in it forever. Um, and she was a little bit um difficult with showings but this kid he it was his first listing he was trying had a picture in front of the sign and everything so five days go by we've shown it she's caused some issues but we got through it um we got multiple offers coming in it's eight o'clock at night and i'm on the phone with him because of all the offers coming in we're talking about everything and we're getting beat by um an agent who put in one of the multiple offers and I'm yeah. like, I'm not going to get back to her yet. I'll call her when I get done. Maybe she wants to change something, whatever. So she keeps beeping me. And so I say to the kid, I'm like, Hey, hold on a second. Let me just answer and find out what she wants. And she goes, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. And I said, what? <laughs> said, you haven't heard yet. And I said, what? She said, the house is burning down right now. <laughs> and I'm like, how do you know this? Goes, I know the neighbor. Fire. She said, the neighbor saw me showing it the other day and the neighbor just called me and sent me this video and she sends me a video and this is a fully evolved fire. Like I'm not talking, you know, a little smoke. I'm talking, you see flames. Yeah. Like on the news. uh, Oh, we have a three alarm fire at uh, Kathleen's listing. Uh, Yeah. So we had to call all the people that put the offers in and say, we can't sell the house right now because it just burned down. And then we teased our agent a little bit about, all his listings being hot listings or, yeah. you know, this one's on fire, you like know, and that the roof, stuff. the roof, the um, roof. And guess what? He's no longer in the real estate business. He's now bartending to Florida. So he really wasn't meant for the business. <laughs> it's not for everybody. It's not for but, everybody. Yeah, that was, that was a good one. That was a good one. Yeah. Well, Colleen, thank you. Or Colleen, depending on how you say it, folks, I didn't get many responses. Again, watch this on the playback. Do you say Colleen? You can put it in the comments to be C O E would be the phonetically, right? Or Colleen, which is Rochester's accent. Salad. People call me Colleen too. That's a UK. This is weird to me. I don't know. It is weird. It's UK. All right. Well, let's give you a round of applause. <laughs> Pew! And then I'm going to come back over here. Beep, beep. All right, guys, listen. 
This is Jeremiah. It's J-Man Monero with J-Man Speaks. Uh, we put in the comments, if you want to hear about any kind of upcoming packages or investment opportunities, uh, we can add you to this before it hits the market kind of a list. Exclusive. That's one thing. And if you got anything of value out of today's session, today's live stream, share it. Share it with a friend because we would love to have 9, 12, 15, 35, 90, 99 people on here live. Uh, so that we can help you. There's no charge for this. I don't charge you for all these nuggets you're dropping in your lap. So at least share it with other people. It's Jeremiah, it's J-Man Monero with J-Man Speaks. And make it a great day. See ya.